It's a pleasure to be welcoming you to this lecture by Zephyr Teachout in the State of Democracy series. I'm Grant Reher. I'm director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute. And I really, I really am delighted uh, with the turnout here and the interest that we have received in this lecture in the days prior to it happening. Uh, I know that this is the closest I'm going to come in my life to introducing a rock star, so I am, I am relishing this moment. Uh, and, and I also want to say hello in particular to folks that are watching uh, Professor Teachout's talk on live stream. I understand that there is a group of Rochester teachers um, that are watching, so hello, hello to you folks. Uh, we really appreciate that interest. And I'll have some more substantive things to say about Professor Teachout in a moment, but first I, I want to thank some folks and I want to deal with some logistics. Uh, I want to offer thanks to the Dean's Office for supporting the series and for technical support. I want to thank the Information and Computing Technology Group and in particular Tom Fazio, the, the audio and recording engineer uh, for the event. I want to give my thanks as well to Bethany Wallowender and Kelly Coleman. They work in the Campbell Institute and they work very hard to put these events together. Uh, and in particular, uh, I want to thank the Norman M. and Marsha Lee Berkman Fund for funding this particular lecture. Our format this afternoon is that uh, Professor Teachout will speak for about 45 or 50 minutes or so, and then I'm going to ask her a couple questions that are prompted by her talk. And then after that, we'll ask all of you to join in, and we will take your questions and your brief comments. And when we do that, I'd like to ask you to please wait for the microphone to be passed to you so that you are part of the live stream, but also part of the archive that we have. Uh, we'll also try to take questions from the overflow room, and uh, what uh, folks there can do is to pass your questions to Kelly Coleman, and then um, they'll be brought back up here, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll choose one or two, uh, we'll, depending on time, more uh, to, to, to put the professor teach out. And then after all that, we will go to the foyer out here for a reception where there will be food and drink, and Professor Teachout's new book will be there for you to purchase and to be signed by her, uh, if you like. So I have one important additional announcement, and that is, if you haven't already done so, please take this particular moment to silence all of your cell phones and any other devices that make noise. We want to we keep the smartphones smart, okay? Now, let me say a few words about our speaker, and, and then I will... Uh, I will sit down and we can hear from her. Zephyr Teachout is a law professor at Fordham University and she recently challenged Andrew Cuomo for the Democratic nomination for governor of New York, finishing with about 33% of the total vote, more than I think anyone would have expected when she started. Her past experiences include Director of Internet Organizing for the Howard Dean Presidential Campaign in 2004 and National Director of the Sunlight Foundation. Professor Teachout didn't win the nomination, but she has arguably re-energized the political reform movement in New York and has genuinely become, as I said at the outset, something as a rock star for progressive activists in the state and beyond. She's a dynamic person, which if you don't already know, you're about to discover. But I think part of her appeal as a candidate was something beyond that, which after the campaign season that we just experienced, maybe I should say the campaign season that we just endured, um, but I saw coming in Diane Dwyer, where, where is she? Okay, so you were an exception to that with very positive ads, thank you for that. But, but, I think, but I think part of Professor Teachout's appeal was um, uh, particularly welcome for, for, for something beyond even that. And it's that, it's that you're getting an authentic experience when you hear her. She speaks with the courage of her convictions, but she also has some real convictions, which we can consider and we can debate today. Uh, her book, titled Corruption in America, From Benjamin Franklin's Snuffbox to Citizens United, has generated attention from places like the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and the New Yorker magazine. Uh, the, uh, uh, the book was released uh, last September, uh, a couple months ago, and I want to note that it's still selling relatively well. 
for a university press book. So what I want to end by is to say that Zephyr may have lost the battle last September, uh, but I think there's evidence that she's got some real traction in her longer war that she is fighting. So welcome to the Maxwell School. Thank you. This is an amazing audience. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you to the uh, Berkman Fund for hosting it. And thank you to Grant, who I met, I think, a decade ago. Is that right? Back to the Dean's. Yeah, he was, I was the director of online organizing for Howard Dean's campaign. And he was one of the experts on online organizing. Um, so we have a long, <laughs> long collaboration, which I appreciate. Um, what, of course, I really appreciate is about my book, which I'm thrilled about, is you know, this really is an academic book where I got a $1,000 advance. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite compliment about the campaign is that we could stretch a nickel further than anybody. <laughs> and Andrew Cuomo's book, All Things Possible, got a $700,000 advance. <laughs> so I'm going to talk. Um, uh, can you all hear me? OK. Um, I'm going to talk. Uh, this I, I'm going to engage a lot of things from my book in this talk here. This the book about the history of the meaning of corruption in American law. Um, the topic is: Can American democracy survive corruption? I'm not going to tell you the answer till the end. Um, but I was so excited to be coming to speak to many of you who are students, thinking about being a student. 25 years ago this past week, I was a freshman in college, and uh, there was an earthquake in San Francisco. Does anybody remember that in 1989? There's an earthquake in San Francisco, and about a month later, the wall comes down between, uh, in Berlin. So I wasn't a very political freshman, and it felt like the earthquake had sort of caused communism to fall. <laughs> I was studying um, Hegel. They, we were talking a lot about how the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. I didn't really understand it then. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure I understand it now. But what I did understand and what I believe infused that time of the late 80s was a sense that history in some sense was ending that democracy as a formal structure had been figured out as the best form of self-government. We had effectively defeated an alternative form of the communist regime. And the job of history moving forward was now just to let all the other countries catch up. I'm sure those of you who are more adult than I was a 17-year-old didn't think that. But you know, I wasn't alone. There's this famous book at the time, Frank, Francis Fukuyama, called The End of History. Um, and actually, if you're fair to Fukuyama, he doesn't say that history is over. But there is a story about the best form of government being figured out. And we're sort of on our way towards no longer struggling with core questions of democracy, capitalism, and how they're all going to work out. I'm embarrassed to say that. Uh, I actually remember some conversations as a college student where we bemoaned the fact that the great issue, world issues had all been basically solved. <laughs> I devoted myself to grunge and derivative poetry. <laughs> so obviously, what I have now learned, both as an adult and I think those of us in our generation have learned, is that History and democracy does not have a single telos or arc or tendency, but actually is a constant um, struggle. And history doesn't necessarily bend in one direction, but moves back and forth in both beautiful and terrifying ways. Um, I do still want to celebrate the coming down of the wall, because as the political scientists in the room may remember, <laughs> The collapse of the Soviet Union was deemed impossible by the experts of the Soviet Union. So if anybody wants to talk to you about impossible, remember this moment where you see students walking through a wall that they had once been shot for touching. And it's a reminder that impossible things can actually change, even if power structures seem absolutely forced. The topic is then corruption in America and whether we can 
in some ways avoid this you know, terrible, what I think is, is a terrible disease and flaw that has overtaken our, our system. But I want to start with some definitions. Um, I did not study Latin, so this is one part that didn't make the book, and the Latin scholars can correct me. But uh, uh, corruption comes from the Latin verb corrompera. Um, to uh, rompera is to break apart, and co is with. So if you think of a similar word, disrupt or corrupt, disrupt is a force breaking something apart from the outside, and corrupt is breaking apart from within, an internal disintegration. Communities and human personalities can then be broken or corrupted from within. It undermines predictability and accountability and erodes social trust. And in some cases, you'd say the integrity of a human personality is corrupted. In other cases, you'd say the integrity of a system is corrupted. I have to start with Aristotle, and then I'll fast forward. <laughs> So Aristotle set out these six different ways that government can constitute itself. And it sep he separated the three positive ways from the three negative ways by those which were, had integrity and those which were corrupt. There were three kinds of governments and three perversions. The rule of one, the rule of the few, and the rule of many. The rule of one is monarchy, or if corrupted, tyranny. The rule of the few is uh, aristocracy, or if corrupted, oligarchy. And the rule of the many is timocracy, or if corrupted, democracy. You can ignore that bit for a second. <laughs> but the basic difference between the two is whether the monarch, or, or it's easiest to imagine the monarch or the, um, the tyrant. The difference between the monarch and the tyrant is the monarch served the public, and the tyrant served himself. And the difference between an aristocracy and an oligarchy is the um, arist aristocracy served the public and the oligarchy served itself. And so the key difference, the key traditional defining difference of corruption is whether, in the political sphere, is whether the public institutions are publicly oriented or privately or selfishly oriented. And at the Constitutional Convention, so just to be clear, the difference between, in Aristotle, the corrupt and non-corrupt does not lie in criminal law. It doesn't lie in whether there's a bribery statute being violated. It lies in the orientation of the ruler or the governor towards the public. And this is very much the approach that the new Americans took at the Constitutional Convention. At the Constitutional Convention, you could, you could basically say corruption was an obsession. They talked about corruption more than they talked about violence or factions or basically any other topic. Every question of uh, governmental design was basically went through the ringer of would this lead to greater or less corruption. And you could basically say this is a money and politics convention. In Madison's notebook, uh, you see, and we have a wonderful Madison expert here. <laughs> uh, in Madison's notebook, you see the word corruption in long hand written out 54 times over the summer, and then variations on the theme of the question of, would the smaller size or the larger size of a legislature corrupt? How big should the veto be? One of the big uh, topics on whether the veto, the percentage needed for the veto was whether the uh, president would retain too much power, if the veto was too high, if it required, if it required 90%, then the, uh, the, basically the president could bribe the other 10%. <laughs> um, the uh, question, a well, long lost idea was that the idea that the presidential election should all be held on the same day. Um, the, uh, as Hamilton um, said, if we hold it all on the same day, nobody can exercise any bribery or corruption on the, uh, in the presidential election because basically the travel time is too long between states. <laughs> so the business of corruption, he said, Hamilton said, describing this provision, was, um, which is to embrace so considerable a number of men requires time as, as well as means. Nor would it be found easy suddenly to embark them, dispersed as they would be over 13 states. <laughs> 
um, to basically organize a corrupting of a presidential candidate. So we said, if we have it all on the same day, different states will all independently vote for their candidate without any kind of coordinated effort. Television and the internet got rid of that part. So some of my, I'm going to highlight a few of the, I think, really interesting discussions at the Constitutional Convention. Um, one was the discussion about um, what they called the problem of placemen. This is basically our a version of our revolving door problem. The problem of placemen was those people in the parliament in England. That basically, all of this is sort of a rejection of England and a rejection of what's happening in the States. They see this, what uh, Patrick called the finest fabric that human nature had ever reared in England, except that it had become corrupt. So how can we build a society that um, is not corrupt the way that England, England is. And so what they saw is that people would go into public office in England not to serve their constituents, but because if you went into public office, you'd get a good job from the king. And so they would end up serving the king instead of serving their constituencies. They would be place men. This was such a big topic that um, Benjamin Franklin wrote a speech, his first speech, the major speech of the convention, uh, was about the, the problem of having anybody ever get paid for public office ever. <laughs> because if they got paid, then it would lead to people going into public office um, in order to get, an, get going to elected office in order to get an appointed office. Um, and they, they debated this time and again, and that we now have a provision in the Constitution which George Mason called the cornerstone of the Constitution. Uh, which forbids holding elected and appointed office at the same time. Um, another provision that uh, they talked about, not at the convention, but before and after that I, that I love, and um, it is reflected in the, um, the title of my book, Benjamin Franklin's Stuff Box to Citizens United, is that there's a provision in the Constitution that forbids taking a gift of any kind whatever. And that, that of any kind whatever, that's in the Constitution. <laughs> that kind of petulant, insistent, no gifts of any kind, whatever, from foreign powers. And this comes from, actually it comes from a provision, um, they stole it from the Netherlands. The Netherlands had this, this same provision, and they were made fun of for it. Uh, basically, an international scholar at the time said, who do, they, who do they think they are? They think they're creating Plato's Republic and the Fens and Marshes? Um, but it was the habit to give gifts and accept gifts um, as diplomats. And Benjamin Franklin got this jeweled snuff box from the King of France with a picture of the uh, king on it. And um, he had to basically first take it in front of Congress and get permission. And when they were describing this provision in the Constitution, which we still have, they said, we needed to include it because a box was given to... Um, uh, a, a box was given to a diplomat by a, 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 one of our friends, and we were concerned that this would corrupt him. There was no evidence of any kind of bribe, but the concern was that it, once he'd taken this gift, he would just look more favorably. He would, you know, when you're having discussions about France, he would take French economic interests more seriously. And it just shows how demanding they were and how much they saw corruption basically threatening at the gates in every way, that you couldn't even allow uh, any gift, uh, a kind of any gift whatsoever. Mason said of the Constitutional Convention later describing it, if we don't protect against corruption, we will soon be at an end. And you saw that same language everywhere, that, that sort of the central job was protecting against corruption. Hamilton said we had to put in every practical, practicable obstacle. I want to tell you one more snuffbox story. So, you know, Jefferson is our favorite hypocrite. <laughs> and Jefferson was a huge fan of the stuff of the provision against gifts and demanded that everybody uh, follow it until he went to France. <laughs> Got a diamond gift from the king of France and then realized he was going to have to report it to Congress. You know, this, by this point, it had become more normal. John Jay had brought a horse before Congress to get permission to keep it. And, uh, and so what Jefferson does is asks his closest aide to take all the diamonds out, smuggle them, take them to a diamond seller, sell them, and put all the funds towards his own personal account. We love him and we hate him. <laughs> So 
what happened to this post-revolutionary, post sort of uh, post-constitutional period? You know, you've you've built your charter, you have your mission statement. One possibility is that this idea and this vigilance against corruption basically falls apart almost immediately. Um, but what it turns out is that for the next 200 years, really, in the courts, and my focus is the courts, and I, uh, if I was to write a book called Corruption in America about what happened outside the courts, I would never have had time to run for office. <laughs> You'd see me in a couple hundred years. <laughs> But what I was really interested in is the way that law dealt with questions of corruption. And you see that corruption actually comes up, uh, the, the question of what is corrupt and what is not corrupt is one of the hardest issues in law. So there's an early um, instance where all members of the Georgia, basically Georgia passed a law giving away millions of acres, pennies on the acre, uh, selling millions of acres to the Yazoo Company. <laughs> It was called the real estate deal of the millennium. <laughs> Every single lawmaker who had voted for it had stock in the company that they sold it to. So the voters of Georgia got upset, and they did what you're supposed to do when you see corruption, which is they voted out to the entire Georgia legislature. <laughs> but that wasn't enough. They were so angry that they took the bill that, uh, that, get, that uh, gave away the land and set fire to it. And then they passed a new bill saying that last bill was illegitimate because it was passed by corrupt means. And you have to understand there are basically no criminal bribery laws at this time. No state has criminal bribery laws. Georgia doesn't have any criminal bribery laws. There's bribery laws that affect judges, but no bribery laws that, that apply to legislators. So they say, but look, this, this law was passed only because everybody had an interest in the outcome. This case divides the country for about a decade as the question of the legality of the sale is debated back and forth. It finally goes up to the Supreme Court and is decided by Justice Marshall. Justice Marshall um, himself, of course, had also been a land speculator in similar things. So you may we had a problem there. And the, uh, the, lawyer for the, um, uh, the lawyer for the state of Georgia, Luther Martin, who's supposed to be one of the greatest lawyers of his generation, was also called Lawyer Brandy Bottle. I believe it is the only instance where at oral argument um, they actually had to stop it so he could sober up <laughs> and then come back and finish his argument, which he failed at. Um, but you see, it's an interesting puzzle for the Supreme Court, is can you actually outlaw a law? Is a law so fundamentally illegitimate because it's passed through corrupt means or not? And that is a question that came up again and again, actually, through the um, 1870s and 1880s, as railroads would bribe basically every member of a legislature. And the question is, is it a law or is it not a law? Is it fundamentally illegitimate because it's been passed through bribery or not? And actually, the Supreme Court at different points went different ways. One of the most um, exciting ongoing uh, sort of disco or exciting discoveries I found in this is the, was the law of lobbying. So there, what, lobbying really wasn't a word or wasn't an idea until, you know, at the earliest, the 1830s. It becomes more common in the 1850s. And pretty soon, courts have to decide, how do you deal with lobbying? What is lobbying? Is lobbying legitimate? Is lobbying corrupt? Is lobbying corrupting? And almost every court that dealt with it found that lobbying was so fundamentally corrupt that they wouldn't enforce contracts to lobby. So just think about it, like in general, like somebody, I don't know, you hire somebody to put a roof on your house. And uh, they put a roof on your house, and then they ask you to pay them. The, I don't know how much a roofing costs these days. A couple thousand, five, that's a lot, probably a lot more than that. My brother-in-law is a roofer, so I don't have to. <laughs> um, but $5,000? And then you have to pay that contract. And if you don't pay that contract, you go to court and say, please pay me that contract. Well, there's certain kinds of contracts that have always been seen so outside the law and so threatening to society that they just aren't enforced at all. Like typically, contracts for paid sex are not enforced. Contracts for selling organs are not enforced. You can't sell babies. So if there is a sale, an agreement, and then you go to sue on that contract, that contract will not be enforced by the courts. 
this is how courts dealt with lobbying. They said basically this is like, they didn't use this phrase, but you know, babies or sex or metro cards. It is something that you cannot sell. It is not a vendable, basically, and the, the, the non-vendable, non-sellable thing was personal influence. That a citizen's personal influence is something precious which they cannot sell to another person. So my favorite uh, case of this is a case that goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. This old man in Virginia is owed um, a you know, couple $20,000 from, he loaned the US government money for the Battle of Guadalupe, but he at this point is too old himself to go and actually ask Congress for his money back. So he hires a Boston lawyer, and the Boston lawyer goes to Washington, um, meets with Congress members, writes letters, persuades them, the old man gets his money back, the lobbyist asks for his money, and the old man, actually the old man's son at this point, says, I'm not gonna pay you. That was a contract to lobby. And as you know, contracts to lobby are wrong. So this case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme, there's no, the Supreme Court looks at it, and there's no evidence of any bribery in this case. There's no, like, the, the bribery concern would be that the lobbyist had paid the lawmaker, basically. Old man pays the uh, lobbyist, lobbyist pays the lawmaker, and that's how the, the uh, money gets back. There's no evidence of any bribery or anything untoward, but um, uh, the Supreme Court says, if we were to allow lobbying in this instance, if we're to enforce this contract, the great corporations of our day would soon hire adventurers to press their cases, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing at this point, the adventurers was not paraphrasing. <laughs> Uh, the great corporations of our day would soon hire adventurers to press their case in the halls of Congress and the state houses, and every right-thinking man would call that corrupt. So they saw lobbying as a fundamentally corrupt and corrupting practice because it did a few different things. One is it put the lobbyist in a position where they are selling their civic obligations. Another is it creates extraordinary temptation for money to be used to directly or indirectly influence lawmakers in ways that you may never be able to uncover. And it basically allows for money um, to become power through the alchemy of lobbying as opposed to just the direct bribe. That, those cases fell away in the, 18, in the 1930s, um, largely because of a rise of a changing view of contract law but also a changing view of the First Amendment. But in these early cases, the First Amendment didn't actually come up that often. It's really, uh, really at all. It's really um, interesting. So what happens? We're, you know, this is uh, Shakespeare in 30 seconds. Um, in the early 20th century, you see this sort of struggle between, uh, as the courts become more active, you see the struggle in applying bribery laws. Should you apply them to legislatures? How do you apply them? Uh, increasing number of bribery prosecutions. You see um, in the progressive populist era pushes for both antitrust and campaign finance reform. The Democratic Party's 1924 platform included a call for public financing of elections. And then in the 1970s, or 19, again, I'm, I'm missing huge swaths of American history, so forgive me. But I want to talk about the sort of the current era. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, you see a whole bunch of changes. Um, and this is the, the contemporary threat of corruption. At different times, it's been different threats. At one point, it was the spoil system. Now I see these as the threats. In the 1980s, lawmakers in Washington would spend about 15 hours a year fundraising. Now they spend 15 hours a week at minimum. Members of Congress spend between 30 and 70% of their time fundraising. So it's not just the absolute amount of money has changed, the actual job of being a lawmaker has changed substantially in the last 30 or 40 years. Fundraising used to be an annoying part of the job, perhaps, aside, but not the fundamental job. And now it is the fundamental job in so many ways. You also see a real cultural shift in the treatment of lobbying. Lobbying moves from something that is sort of, 
accepted in the rare in instance, but a little bit shameful, even through the 60s and 70s. A little bit tacky. Actually, when super PACs, uh, when Citizens United um, uh, happened, a lot of people said, corporations aren't going to, um, aren't going to engage in political spending because it's kind of tacky. <laughs> it won't look good for them. And, and they were right for that moment. But you see the change in lobbying from being something that's seen as outside of you know, reasonable corporate behavior to actually the core center of reasonable corporate behavior and something that you have to do if you're going to be taken seriously. You also see changes in the Supreme Court. First, Buckley versus Vallejo, um, which strikes down limits on campaign spending. So in response to Watergate, and, and actually years and years and years of, of activism, um, uh, the uh, Congress passes laws that don't just limit campaign fundraising, but actually limit total amount of money spent. We are outside the norm in Western Europe on this. The absolute, most countries limit how much money you can spend on campaigns, not just how much money you can raise on campaigns. And so this is a very natural thing. If you limit the spending, you limit the time fundraising, because you can only spend so much time uh, fundraising if there's a cap on spending. That's struck down in Buckley versus Vallejo, because um, um, among other things, Buckley versus Vallejo said the spending limit had no relationship to this, uh, con this constitutional value of corruption. They said that money spent politically equaled was a version of political speech, and you could only justify uh, infringements on free speech if the law was designed to limit corruption. And they couldn't find a reason why limits on spending would limit corruption. And then, of course, in recent years, you've seen Citizens United and McCutcheon versus FEC. And in both of those cases, the Supreme Court um, says very explicitly that corruption is simply criminal law bribery quid pro quo. In McCutcheon versus FEC, which is this recent case that actually just came down this spring, um, the court cited a criminal law statute when defining corruption. It was defining corruption by reference to a criminal law statute passed by Congress. Which itself is kind of circular. It's an interesting mix. And also a complete uh, rejection of basically the first 200 years of understanding of what corruption meant in law and certainly what the framers understood. So now, where are we? You know, we have private interests that spend over $12 million per member of Congress on lobbying. Each member of Congress, I mean, really, just stop and think about that. I know the numbers get so big that it's a little confusing, but just imagine if 12 million, just think of yourself. And if somebody wanted to spend $12 million convincing you of something, they might be able to do it. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 uh, it goes through a combination of um, Outside uh, direct, you know, ad direct advertisements, information studies, uh, interpersonal connections, surrounding you with a social community. I mean, a lot of the money is actually spent on building a social community, so that you build enough people in Washington or in Albany that they actually affect the culture in some fundamental way. And it starts to feel a little bit strange to talk so openly about whether it's minimum wage or whatever else you care about, because everybody around you in the social community is in some ways uh, on the take on the other side. Now, in 1970, 3% of senators and Congress um, uh, members became lobbyists when they left office. Now it is the likely career of a congressperson or senator upon leaving office to become a lobbyist. Over 50%. That's a total change from the 70s. And that, of course, is the modern problem of placement. People are going into uh, elected office serving not their constituency, but serving their future selves. And again, if you think about yourself, if you know you're moving into another job, you're going to serve your future master as well as your current one. So if you're aware that your most likely career path is a well-paid lobbying job. It's going to change who you are. This is what uh, Pierce Butler said 230 years ago. A man takes a seat in parliament to get an office for himself or friends. This is the great source from which flows its venality and corruption. He could say the same thing about the modern Congress. 
All right. I, you know, I had, I had some thoughts about sort of modern super PACs and the role they play. I, I think, though, you know, a lot of the numbers you know intuitively. I don't think you need to know the numbers. All, a lot of it, what it is, and I can speak to this from my campaign, um, is just an awareness that infinite money can be spent against you if you take certain positions has a real effect. So if you're taking on the Comcast Time Warner merger, you have to do so fully aware that Comcast or Time Warner can spend both money and their own channels against you. And a lot of times, that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, you flipping on an issue, but it leads to something which is incredibly dangerous, which is just silence. So there's so many issues which people care about and respond to, and you might find people talking about in rooms. But if you know that talking about those things is going to make it a little bit harder to raise $20,000 or make it a little more likely that's, that there's going to be a negative attack ad on you, it might be easier just to forget those issues and talk about things where it doesn't hurt to speak about. So something I cared about a, a lot of my campaign is um, public education, small class sizes, and the institution of teachers unions. And I will tell you as a fundraiser that it was something that came up fairly often among wealthy donors, is that their own um, resistance to teachers unions, there's something weird going on there that I haven't quite figured out. Uh, there, there's a, a not merely venal resistance to teachers unions in certain social communities that I don't entirely understand. But it certainly becomes very clear that it's easier just not to talk about it. <laughs> It's, not easy, it's easier just to sort of focus on the issues where there isn't controversy and where there isn't money involved. And I think we feel that in the anti-poetry of a lot of modern politics, that we feel candidates, even if we think they're telling the truth, we don't think they're telling the truth. Not that they're lying, but that there are some truths they're not telling, that there are some things that are being held back. And if you're in a relationship with somebody and you feel like they're always giving you messages that pull really well, <laughs> but they're not telling you everything, you leave that relationship, <laughs> whether that's a friend or a partner. But I think we see something similar in politics is people's own sense uh, that the, there's a lack of honesty and a lack of forthrightness and too much polling and too little honesty in the, not just polling, and too much serving the uh, wealthiest interests and not enough honesty. And I think that sort of helps explain a lot of the disaffection from politics itself. It's not just that the sentences are wrong in the messaging. So, the, the other, yeah, the other thing I was going to talk about, like, think about what this means as, as the job of, you know, we've elected public officials in thousands of different ways, not thousands, dozens of different ways over world history. Like, who can fight best? Who is the wittiest? Who is the most strategic? Who are you related to? Who is good looking? I mean, these aren't all good ways, but there's all these different ways. And right now, we are selecting our leaders based on who is willing to sit in a room and dial time after time after time and ask for money in a somewhat sycophantic way. I really care about what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a real disconnect to play that role and then in the afternoon to spend your morning in that role as a beggar in front of oligarchs and then your afternoon as a true leader laying out in an inspiring and confident way the things that you think can happen. That's a weird personality combination. So what can we do? They've, the wall came down, so we're not done. <laughs> you know, when I get disaffected, and I do, um, I think about what it would be like to be in 1900. Like if you were in 1900 and you were a populist progressive like myself, first of all, I wouldn't be able to vote. <laughs> and it wouldn't be because there hadn't been suffragists uh, actively protesting for three decades. African Americans have no political rights. And we fought a civil war. There's a 15th Amendment that has no meaning. And the populists and the and progressives have been talking about down with monopoly for decades. Instead, you have McKinley and a closed down, banker driven, railroad owned economy and democracy. But as we see, 
the pressures of all of those groups led to 1907, the Tillman Act, banning corporate um, con contributions to campaign, and eventually to 19, the 1930s, and FDR, and eventually to the 1960s and 70s in the Civil Rights Movement. So all of those actions are possible, and we can get out of this closed down moment we're in. Because I do think the house is on fire in terms of the democracy. I mean, I'm, um, but there are two fixes without the Supreme Court that I've been focused on. One is changing the way we fund campaigns. There's, I wish there were more, but there's two ways you fund campaigns. You either fund them privately or you fund them publicly. The, public, the private system has not worked, and we have to move to a, a, system, a public system of funding campaigns. And the second is, you know, going back to Teddy Roosevelt. We got to break up the big companies. That means not just break up the big banks and stop the Comcast Time Warner merger, but actually truly go after concentrated power in this country that is taking over our economy and our democracy because too much power is held by too few. Jefferson, I know. <laughs> Jefferson wanted an anti-monopoly clause in the Constitution. He was really smart about a lot of things. <laughs> he wanted an anti-monopoly clause in the Constitution because he and they understood that decentralized economic power was as fundamental as anything else to having a representative and responsive democracy. And we had antitrust and anti-monopoly where we can break up big ag, take on Amazon, take on big cable. Um, we had that as part of our political ethos basically until 1981. And then starting in 1981, Reagan rewrote the antitrust guidelines to say antitrust is just this technical thing that none of you understand. And it's all about efficiency and the HHI index and your eyes glaze over. Antitrust is technical for specialists. Antitrust is not political for democracy. And I believe, and I'll tell you, when I was running for, the, running for governor, you'd get into rooms and people don't know what antitrust is. They don't know what anti-monopoly is. We have actually taken these critical political words out of our political vocabulary, so much so that people don't even think it's possible. But it is possible. We used to break up companies if they took over 5% or more of their marketplace. You're not a monopoly when you're at 90%. You're a monopoly if you have the power to set the terms of price, basically. You're to, you can be a monopoly at really, really, really small levels if you have too much power. And so what I think we need to do is to return to the old anti-monopoly, antitrust, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt, Thomas Jefferson understanding of power. Because fundamentally, if we are going to survive this problem of corruption, we need to get all the people who do believe in a public interest orientation, the possibility of public servants serving the public good, which I do. I know it's hard, but I believe it's possible. But we have to create structures that allow it to happen. Because I'm thinking Eastern Europe, I'm going to end with Václav Havel, who is a, um, important in the uh, Czech Revolution. This is, what, uh, this is my answer to the question about, can we survive? Hope, he said, is a state of mind, not of the world. Either we have hope or we don't. It's a dimension of the soul. And it's not essentially dependent on some particular estimation, observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not prognostication. It is an orientation of the spirit and orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. And I believe that kind of hope is what enables the kind of transformational change that we need now to survive the corruption of American democracy. Thank you.
thank you very much. <laughs> a lot of material for us to, to think about, and I'm sure you're going to get some good questions. Let me just uh, ask a couple things that occurred to me while you were uh, while you were speaking. And the first question, I want to get at it with a couple of really quick anecdotes. Um, the first one I can take care of in a sentence, which is that you mentioned twelve million dollars spent to convince every single member of Congress. So you could. You could probably convince me of pretty much anything you want to get to be for a hundred thousand. <laughs> but I, 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 the other, the other, the other anecdote to get at this question is I, I was reminded of a story that the journalist William Grider told about um, his coming up as a journalist, as a political reporter, and when he was just starting out, he was assigned to cover um, a state legislature. It was one of sort of the backwater state legislatures and he was there and he was watching, he was watching with a senior reporter. He said he got there and he was looking down on the floor, the legislators were throwing paper airplanes at each other, throwing wadded up pieces of paper, um, yelling and screaming, and he turned to this reporter and kind of said, what's going on? And the reporter said, you should see their constituents. <laughs> so the, the question that I've got for you that gets at is, what is, what's our role? In this, because you tracked out some pretty big structural yeah. changes. Um, Technology is a big piece of the picture. Obviously, television is what a lot of this money is spent on. <laughs> so the question is, what's what's the average citizen's culpability in this, or have we been spectators mm -hmm. in this change? And maybe from there we can talk about possible uh, uh, remedies that might be based yeah. there. But, uh, yeah, I tend to think the citizen has a pretty big responsibility. Um, and this is a very, you know, this is where I'm very old fashioned, um, is that there is a response, there's an office of citizenship. Actually, in the first um, 30 years, Washington would forget that we were citizens uh, and sometimes call us subjects instead, <laughs> and was upset that people were protesting in between elections, because he said, well, once I'm president, well, your job is done. <laughs> but so the fight to be called citizen is actually a serious fight, not to just be a subject and a ruled character. And I think it does carry responsibility. Um, and there's a modern trend in political science to see citizens as deeply passive and to not demand very much. Um, I actually, uh, I, one of the ways in which I then differ with some other modern conceptions of corruption is I think a citizen can be corrupt just by trying to use these, uh, you know, use lobbying or other forms if they're trying to use it for selfish ends. So, um, but I actually think, I, I, look, not all the time. We can't all be citizens actively all the time. <laughs> but I think there's a real joy in it. Uh, and some of you may be f familiar with the philosopher Hannah Arendt, who's had a big impact on me. And she talks about the, um, the, the degree to which actually exercising citizenship, you know, politics, she says, is when people come together and say, what should we do? And that there's a real special joy and power in that kind of collective self-government that doesn't come from any other thing. So as hard as it is, it's also actually a very empowering and exciting thing. I've been double mic'd since we since, oh. we, since you were talking, <laughs> but but so 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 now I have a question then for you about your own personal experience on the campaign. You mentioned some things yes. about it, and you were talking about corruption, your sense of corruption, and I think the insight about silence is really key. I mean, I I've heard that from elected officials that I've talked to, talking off the record or talking privately, that that is the way that they will admit that money affects them most frequently. It's just choosing not to make an issue about something. So, you had to dial for dollars. Yes. Uh, you had to break through this thing that you've been talking about. So did you have any particular experiences in doing that where you felt like you were becoming uncomfortable with what was going on and not necessarily that you were becoming, to use your word, corrupt, but that, you know, that, Beast was in the room somewhere with you while you were making that phone call. I mean, could you talk a little bit about how you worked through that at a very kind of yeah, retail yeah. level? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I raised about eight hundred thousand dollars, and I was lucky because a lot of it was not lucky. It's we worked hard for it, <laughs> but uh, I, I, we raised from nine thousand donors, and our average donor was fifty-seven dollars. 
Um, but $800,000, you know, if I had $4 million or, or $10 million, we could have done TV, we could have done mailings. We didn't quite have, we didn't have enough to reach the state. Um, but some of that money was in traditional uh, call time. So I spent uh, probably a month total of the three and a half months doing call time where you s sit in a room and, and call people. And what you have is you have a, you're supposed to have an estimate of how much they can give. Um, if you have a pretty professional operation, you have all kinds of details about them when you call them. <laughs> um, and I mean, it's really, really very much like a salesman job. Um, but there were a few times where I felt like, um, I guess I, I, I thought people would be a little more subtle about, I will give you money if you take on this position. I mean, nobody ever said that. But you could feel these moments where it was uh, really clear that the contribution depended on what your political position was. Um, and you just wanted to avoid those phone calls. But I, ha I had to make them because I had to raise the money. Um, I just, I, I think I raised a little less money in some pl places because of it. Because I, I had made, a, I had made, I basically made a commitment to myself that I will make every compromise. I will do all the call time I have to do. I will learn messaging. I will learn how to be good on TV. I will learn everything I have to learn, but I'm not going to not tell the truth. Hmm. So that, um, that, that I was sort of determined to not have that affect things. So the tougher version of that question then that follows exactly from what you just said, the, were, were there, was there a time when you did pull back a little bit on something you might have said that you didn't say or you, know, or you trimmed something at the edge? I don't think because of donors. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. So then you mentioned two things as fixes, but mm -hmm. the um, thing that you didn't mention that there are a lot of folks are pretty excited about is this idea of amending the Constitution mm -hmm. to take care of the Supreme Court uh, issue instead of trying to figure out ways to legislate right up against what they right. will accept. So what are your views on that? Do you think that's a productive path to go down? Is that a fool's errand? What, what? So, so people want to amend the Constitution. Um, there's a group called Move to Amend, and there's other efforts to amend the Constitution to basically go to a pre-Buckley versus Vallejo era, mm -hmm. which would give Congress and lawmakers a lot more authority to limit spending and contribution limits and corporate uh, money. And I, um, I agree with what they are doing. I have chosen not to make my activism in that direction for two reasons. Um, but I support it, and I sort of feel like, again, looking at the progressive populist era, you don't know what's going to work. So if, if I tell you you can't do that because that's not going to work, I don't know any better than anybody else. You know, I'm trying every way I can, but um, I, I just, in general, I say yes to people who are doing things in the same direction, even if in a different, <laughs> different method. My, my um, hesitation is that just the process of amending the Constitution requires actually getting the existing incumbent lawmakers um, not only to pass a law to change campaign finance, but actually to get the two-thirds vote and to get all the states to ratify. Um, I, here's the thing I want to be wary of, is it is very easy for politicians to support amending the Constitution and then not doing anything else. Mm. Um, because, and there was a hearing in Washington recently where everybody supported amending the Constitution. I would have been at that he hearing. You know, I would have supported amending the Constitution. But you have not done enough if you are a congressperson and you say, I support amending the Constitution, because they know full well it's not going to happen. And so they have a responsibility to also change the way campaigns are funded. Does that make sense? Um, so that's my only wariness about it, but I mm -hmm. fully, I mean, I think it's given a lot of people a lot of education about the Constitution, and it's valuable in that way, and I hope it leads towards an eventual reversal in the Supreme Court. Let me ask one more quick question, and then we'll get to uh, the audience, and we've got lots of, night, lots of time um, for that. Uh, so you came into this campaign with quite a bit of political savvy, one would argue, right? Director of Internet Organizing for Howard Dean's campaign, you'd been with the Sunlight foundation, obviously you kind of know how the game is played. You get into this situation, what's the most surprise, what's the thing that surprised you the most from your run for you governor? Know that, I, you know what you, I'm going to say. <laughs> the thing that surprised me the most is the number of mistakes Andrew Cuomo made. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, he sued me to try to get me off the, 
ballot saying that I was not a resident of New York, it was the best day of the campaign. <laughs> because all I needed was oxygen. I mean, I had this confidence that if I could reach people, if they knew I existed, we, we, then we could actually do pretty well. So all I needed was attention. And he basically said, let's see, what would give you the most attention? <laughs> A two-day trial in Brooklyn where you get to talk about your life. <laughs> and, and he sued me in part because, you know, I made some mistakes. Uh, I had a car registered in Vermont. And I had a Vermont driver's license. I actually hadn't lived in there for seven years. I'd lived in North Carolina before I moved to New York, but I didn't want to get into those details. Those are relatively human mistakes. But basically, uh, deep down, I think he sued me because I am a renter. <laughs> So unlike most people who run for office and have five-year residency, I don't have land ownership. So I didn't talk about that during the campaign, but I did talk about all my walk-up apartments. And if you want to connect to New Yorkers, it's a hell, excuse my language, it's a hell of a lot easier to be able to connect and talking about, you know, I came to New York with student debt. Um, and so it wasn't a perfect, you know, I, I'm not a perfect person. But it was such a fundamental mistake, I couldn't even believe he was making it. Interesting. Well, <laughs> let's see what people want to ask. And what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll call on two folks at once. Let's get these two right here, and then we'll move around. And so we have, because we have two microphones. So this woman here first, and then this one here second. So and we've, we've got a second microphone coming. So go ahead. Thinking about polls for a second, they are so pervasive, you can't read a news article that doesn't have a poll cited in it. They seem to me to be corrupting. They seem to ennoble ignorance. And so I just wondered if you'd talk about polls in a more general sense for a minute and the effect that they have. Yes, but can you explain what part your particular objection to polls is? Well, partly is that, that they, as I said, they um, ennoble ignorance uh -huh. because Anybody can answer a poll, and it's your said. opinion. It doesn't require any informed notion about whatever the subject is. Yeah. And then that they're, they're so much a part of reporting now that they, they can't, yeah. you know. And they're, they're taken in a way that seems to govern and change what people in politics do. You know, I, I, I am going to agree with you, but first I'm going to disagree. Right now, if we had poll-driven politics, we'd be in better shape. <laughs> 70% of people want to break up the big banks and have greater um, uh, uh, criminal prosecutions. People want minimum wage. They absolutely want to pass, uh, you know, most of the, they want smaller class sizes. They want more funding for schools. They want, I, I, my actually, they, they want to pass public financing and election. My big concern is that we, and there are some serious problems with polls but that even in poll-driven politics, we are no longer responsive. Because if you want to support, say, a financial transactions tax, people in general support a financial transactions tax if they hear about it. Um, it's a version of, it's an incredible, important source of revenue that comes from basically taxing financial transactions the way we tax other transactions. Nobody supports it in an elected office, not because the polls. <laughs> They don't support it because they're scared of what happens with uh, big banks coming down and running a primary against them as quickly as possible. So, so I, I never believed I would feel sentimental towards the old days of poll-driven politics, but we're not in them right now. <laughs> but there, there is still a really insidious effect, and there's so many problems with them. One is the one you identified, which is that um, people feel obliged to answer, and often they know they don't know the answer, but they'll answer. So they aren't actually expressing the degree of conviction that comes out. You know, and, with, and with more information, they would totally change their mind. Another is that you know, creative ideas are dynamic. I was on a conference call once about um, you know, my pet project, Anti-Monopoly. The conference call was about public financing of campaigns. And Stan Greenberg, who's a pollster, said, you know, the really interesting thing that came out is that people want to break up big banks. And I said, do they want to break up big companies? And he said, are we asking that? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they're not. No pollster is asking that. So one of the, the, one of the issues is all the questions that aren't being asked. I care enormously about universal dental care. I don't see a lot of polling about universal dental care. It's just an unasked question. It's a silence. 
So it both leads to a kind of dumbing down of politics, and it leads to a sense of priorities when those aren't actually the, real, the truly felt priorities. I don't really have a solution for polls, though. Um, except an awareness that you should take them with a grain of salt because, you know, look what happened with the Iraq war. The country shifted in a six-month period. I joined Howard Dean's campaign when 75% of the country was in favor of the Iraq war, and six months later it was a quarter. I mean, it moved so quickly. You had your hand up before. Okay. How do you feel about the Supreme Court judges not having a lifetime position hmm. and great question because of political reasons some of the decisions that have been made and now they're putting in the hands of Supreme Court the Obamacare um, and should the judges be elected or yeah. it's on but we're having yeah. trouble hearing you or should the judges be elected or appointed Whew. Um, so, lifetime and elected versus appointed. <laughs> um, so I am less of a fan of judicial review than most law professors. <laughs> and I, 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 you know, I think when you're fighting power, there's different tools that are useful for different times. And the Supreme Court played such an incredibly important role uh, during the civil rights movement that it's hard to let go of that memory and recognize that the Supreme Court may be playing on, on balance a negative role recently. Um, I'm, a, I'm in a supportive of uh, Obama acting like FDR and threatening to pack the court um, around Citizens United, basically adding justices, which we, we could do. Um, and I think that there's something really concerning about the current institution. So I don't actually have a final answer on this, but I've been very intrigued by the proposals around 10-year terms. Uh, for the Supreme Court justices, which is an opportunity to, to make it a slightly more responsive. Um, I, th I think it's a great question. I don't have a final answer, but I keep asking it. <laughs> Sorry. There's a guy, Paul Carrington, who's written some about this, about the, ten the idea of the 10-year term as opposed to the 35 or infinite term. Um, I, I think the current court is deeply troubling. Get, uh here, this gentleman here, and this woman in the back, who I know. We'll get you a second, Peggy. So you talked about a need for campaign finance reform, but there's really little political motivation on that subject to end super PACs. And this kind of seems to me because it's impossible to find like a linkage between the anonymous donations from corporations and politicians actually giving them favorable voting. So do you think there's a way around this problem where it can be made clear to people that campaign finance reform is causing like, political corruption, and why is that not happening now? Um, my, my, uh, somebody I work with a lot, Larry Lessig, who's a law professor at Harvard, um, uh, has brought this, I, uh, describes it this way, and I love, I love it. He says 96% of people think that money in politics is a problem, but 91% think that there's nothing you can do about it. So it's basically the analogy he uses is like if 96% of people say they wish they could fly, but most of them believe they can't, they're not going to spend a lot of energy trying to learn how to fly. As a hang glider pilot, I will tell you, you can fly. <laughs> 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 but um, so I, I actually don't think that, I, I think that most people know the problem. I don't think that is the, the political motivation um, blockage. I think people understand that super PACs are a problem. The vast majority of people want to overturn Citizens United. And I think the vast majority of people oh, think the current system of private financing is a problem. I think what happens is either they don't believe politicians when they say, they either don't believe that uh, public uh, financing is possible, or they don't believe that the politicians who say they support it actually support it. And that level of disbelief is really hard to get over, that lack of like, fundamental trust. So it's not, like it polls really well, but I see the same thing sometimes. People don't, um, they say, I really want to have fair elections, but if they don't believe it's possible, it's like I really want to fly and now I'm going to go work on things I know I can deal with. I, that's all of our jobs to prove pe to people that it is possible. It's worked in New York City. I've been talking a lot recently and I found it, um, maybe this helps as a way to describe it better, that uh, public financing is a real feminist issue and it's a real class issue. 
Uh, a lot more women run in a public financing system. And I don't know why that helps people connect to it. Maybe it's because they can imagine themselves running in some way. Like, why wouldn't I have run before? Why would I run now in a public financing system? I wouldn't run before because I don't have access to the old boys network. And I would run now because all I, all I need to do is inspire 200 people or 2,000 people, and then I'll uh, be able to raise the money to run. I just need to be a grassroots organizer. Um, but I, I like to think we're on the verge of a change there um, because I actually think people, I mean, I don't want to be falsely optimistic. I think we could be on the verge of a change there. New York State, if we get a Democratic Senate in two years, uh, we could pass public financing in New York State. Overwhelm, you know, majority of New Yorkers, including Republicans, want public financing. Um, but if you can crack this puzzle, just you know, call me up because <laughs> it's my mission. <laughs> and that, did I answer your question? Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about lobbying. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I wanted to ask you for a more substantive definition of lobbying rather than a, a more emotional one. In other words, what's the difference, for example, between lobbying and advocacy? Yeah. And um, is lobbying simply advocacy for a cause or a constituency with which one disagrees? In other words, lobbying is for a bad cause, advocacy is for a good cause. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Yeah. Um, and the First Amendment, uh, free speech, and the right to petition implications of restrictions on lobbying. Right. So just to be clear, I'm not actually suggesting we should outlaw. Oh, and lobbying used to be against the law. It was like criminal in California. Right, I understand. Right, yeah. but right. So I'm not actually arguing that we should go back to that direction, but that there is a wisdom in the way that the courts understood and talked about the threat that because of the First Amendment, they don't even talk about the threat anymore. Um, so in the, from the 1860s through the 1910s or so, the way that they made a definition had a lot to do with the location of the um, discussion and whether or not, whether it was in private or public, so that if you gave a public statement to Congress, or uh, preparation of materials was not considered illegal lobbying, it was considered professional services, and that was the, that was the old definition. Um, I, uh, there have been different definitions over time. Of course, now, um, uh, it, the, the private versus public is no longer the definition, but that's how they uh, decided between the two. I agree with you that they're real, um, whether you call it First Amendment or just in general expression concerns about limiting lobbying. But I am just trying to add a little weight on the other side to say that there's a balance of interests here as opposed to a First Amendment which trumps all. And this is probably a good segue to the question that I've got from the overflow room. And what this person wanted to hear more about was uh, if you could talk a little more specifically about how you go about breaking apart um, these large corporations like the big cable companies where there is so much power and so many resources. How do you, how do you, how are you going to go, how do we do that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we might stop the Comcast Time Warner merger. It really could be stopped. And it could have, it, you know, it could have been stopped in New York State because in New York State, so that, the step one is to understand we can stop mergers. Okay. New York State, there was a, basically a public good, public interest standard that Comcast and Time Warner had to justify that their merger served the public interest of New Yorkers. That's, that was the existing legal standard. I think if you take that seriously, the merger fails. Um, we are not used to taking that seriously, but we have existing laws that allow for, for actually protecting against mergers. Mm. Um, that, I think, is a start. Um, I think we should rewrite the 1981 antitrust guidelines. Uh, the existing federal antitrust guidelines see efficiency and the consumer as the only um, thing to pay attention to in deciding whether to allow mergers or not as opposed to a great number of interests, include, including innovation, uh, outsized political power, um, outsized uh, sort of governance power in a market. Um, so if we rewrite re the antitrust gu guidelines on the federal level, that would be a huge start. Um, then I think we may need to pass new antitrust laws. Uh, we may need to revive some of the old pricing laws. Brandeis thought that sort of pricing laws and antitrust laws were some of the keys to a thriving society, allowing producers to have more control over their price. 
Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to be spending a lot of my academic work on trying to identify what new antitrust laws could be. Mm -hmm. So okay. I, I thank you, Overflow Room. I <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. Um, I, I think it's a really Im important <coughs> question. I, I want to start with the premise that we know we can do it, and there isn't anything sort of sanctified about the, the big company that we have to just accept. And since they're playing these quasi, they're basically like, banks are as political as they are market right now. They're, they're playing these political governing roles. And we just have to recognize that and recognize that we have power to do something about that. Okay. Uh, this gentleman and over on this side of the room. Oh, you've got, you've got them already. Okay. You beat me to it. All right. Go ahead. Yes. Is is this on? Can you hear it me? It is, okay. yes. Is fundraising actually the best use of a candidate's, well, I mean, it's not the best use of their time, but in terms of, of campaigning and whatnot, isn't it way more important to get out and, and meet people? I think of, of Heidi Heitkamp, for example, like she was the underdog, but she was knocking on everybody's door. And that means, like if you can convince a room full of people and then they can convince their friends, instead of asking somebody to donate $5, have them talk to five people. And again, you're gonna get people who are more receptive than, you know, We've all seen, you see enough attack ads and it all just kind of goes over your head and you don't even think about it. Like, yes. Without even like having <laughs> formal stuff. Can't you, can't you just have a different, play a different game? No. <laughs> so yes, you are correct that it is a far better use. I am not suggesting, I, I, it's terrible use of a candidate's time. And it's, it's worse than a candidate's time. It's your first job. You're, before you do anything else, it's not like you get to wait three months and fundraise. Your first job is to make a list of the wealthiest people you know. So it's like you're, you enter into the relationship with the public by thinking of the wealthiest people who are not the public. It's a terrible use of time. But no, you can't get around it. Uh, you can if you had really small polities, but people get their information through the press. The press is not going to cover you if, you if you do not have money, period. Uh, unless somebody sues you to get you off the ballot. <laughs> and, the, um, and, and the journalists were very frank with me about this. Uh, we, will, we, can, we want to cover you. You're interesting. But we can't cover you because nobody knows who you are. Now, forget the circularity of that. Nobody knows who you are because we're not covering you. So, <laughs> but nobody knows who you are, and you don't have the money, which makes us believe that they, they will later know who you are. Whereas if you raise money, they'll cover you. If I'd started off with $10 million, they would have covered me from May on as a, as a serious contestant, period. So you, you cannot get out of it uh, under the current system. But the way that we would make decisions on the campaign, towards the end, I actually spent a lot less time fundraising, because if I ever got a press call, that was always more important. Does that make sense? Because then it, you, you're not raising money to get to press. You just go to the press directly. Now, I love the other part of it, being in the rooms. And, and the, I didn't do door to door, but I love the um, small group meetings, the other part. And it is one of the things. I, I have this job, and I, I forgot it tonight. My job is to tell you <laughs> that fundraising is every bit as terrible as, as I was telling you. But campaigning is amazing in every other way. You meet the most inspiring people. You meet the funniest people. You learn things. You learn ways of talking about things. I got pretty radicalized about the state of um, services for uh, mental health care in New York State. And I only learned that through talking to people. I didn't start out. I wouldn't have learned that through a poll, because nobody would have asked a poll on that. Um, it was just that the repeat interactions. And I think I became a better candidate because of that. I would love to spend all my time doing that. And the nice thing about a public financing system is that it gives you permission to do that. And under the current system, you just can't. For this gentleman here. Hi. Um, I'm going to kind of throw a curveball at you. But um, what, are your th what are your thoughts on uh, legalizing professional mixed martial arts in the state of New York? <laughs> that is a total curveball. He York, was not kidding. If I could exp New York is the only state in the country that hasn't legalized professional mixed martial arts. And that's, a lot of that has to do with the political corruption you talked about. That's so interesting. With the office of Sheldon yeah. Silver. I uh, thought you would know yeah. you're just as a go gubernatorial candidate no. of the issue. No, I don't know. But I'll tell you um, how I would. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think, I think we need to repeat yeah. that one. Go ahead. <laughs> Just uh, your thoughts on legalizing professional mixed martial arts in the state of New York. Uh -huh. New York is the only state in the country and um, North, all North America to not legalize the sport. Right. 
So everybody got it. Everybody got it. Now. Did everybody get it? Legalizing mixed martial arts in New York State. New York State is the only state in the country that has not legalized mixed martial arts. Um, I do not have a position on it. <laughs> and, no, but, but I'll take it seriously. And uh, I'll just tell you what I would have done on the campaign. Because we, so we were throwing curveballs every day. And actually, um, one of the things that one of my closest advisors, Barry Lynn, gave me advice on beforehand, which I think is really important, is you want to know your streams of information and your trusted sources before you start running for office. Because when you start running, you are not going to have time to fully investigate all these issues carefully. So let's say that you were a mayor of a small town I was about to come to, and I found out that this is the thing you cared about. I'd have a day to figure it out. And so then I would go to a set of sort of trusted sources that I had figured out beforehand that I trusted and ask them what they thought about it. And now that I have more time, I'll, I can independently research it. But it was actually it was one of the it was a real challenge for somebody because you want to be honest, but you also want to respond to people's real concerns. And you really use these shortcuts or heuristics. And I, if you ever get a chance to talk to a senator or congressperson, ask them where they get their information from because it's so important. And it's why lobbying is so important because it's streams of information that become your trusted source. And you call up and you say, what do you think? And if it turns out my trusted source is somebody who's in the pocket of so-and-so, then I'm going to have a skewed view. Let's see. We'll get somebody in the front here. Here, we'll get this person. We'll get the microphone here. And uh, this gentleman here in the back. And we'll start, we'll start here with, with this woman here in the pink. Right in the front well, row. Um, going along what he said. And speak right in the microphone, oh. yeah. Also in New York, um, independents are not allowed to vote in the primaries. And that's right now like a huge issue because as a registered pendant, it sucks. So I was wondering what you think about that because it's a little it's corrupt. It's, it's weird. And also um, going off with like the corruption in, the, in um, politics, also there's this um, growing trend in universities that they're starting to become corporalized or something like that. And where it's like the people at the top have um, the power to do whatever they feel like, and the students don't have a say in anything, which is why right now in this campus, um, there's a movement where students are sitting in an admissions building and they're speaking up about what they, you know, speaking up against the administration and trying to, you know, get their voices heard. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Um, so, the. Uh, it's, uh, you know, this, the independence voting in, in primaries is one, not that I haven't thought about, but that um, I think is very complicated. Uh, because the concern is that a party would get really taken over. I mean, you can, um, if you don't have to be registered beforehand, you can have a bunch of Republicans taking over and effectively trying to sabotage who wins in the Democratic primary. That's a concern. It may be that it's worth moving that direction just because of the demographic changes and because of so many young people who don't affiliate with either party. I'm a traditional Democrat, and so my own focus has been sort of politically trying to revive the, the best parts of the Democratic Party. Um, but I just that, that's the, the argument against it, is that there's an argument for it and an argument against it. Um, so uh, a, a bunch of a handful of students got in touch with me about the protests here, and um, I met with some of them. Uh, um, and what's true is that I felt actually very similar to mixed martial arts is I felt like I didn't actually know enough about the particular issues. Um, I would say broadly that I'm very concerned about what's happening in higher, I can just say broadly about a uh, move in higher education and corruption in higher education uh, on the whole. It relates a little bit to the institution, you know, institutional purpose, like the institutional purpose of uh, government is supposed to be public serving. And I think it's really important and precious and rare and extraordinary to have an institution, a deeply publicly oriented institution of higher education. And that we should protect that cultural tradition of a public orientation um, as sort of essential. Um, and I, I mean, I see it across the board. I see it in law schools. Um, uh, there's a, Larry Lessig writes about institutional corruption in different areas. And he's doing segments on institutional corruption in higher ed and institutional corruption elsewhere. Go ahead, sir. I'd like your thoughts on the Moreland Commission, whether or not you felt it was legitimate for the governor to shut it down as opposed to legal for him to shut it down. And if you had been elected governor, whether or not you would have reconstituted it 
and felt that it could have been effective? Um, I thought it was totally illegitimate to shut it down. Um, the reasons he gave did not make sense. Uh, if you are interested in serving the public. The Moreland Commission was set up to investigate corruption in New York, and we have a serious problem of both legal and uh, illegal and legal corruption in New York. And the Moreland Commission explicitly had as its purview looking at not just illegal bribery, but also structures that could be changed. Those were not, um, the Moreland Commission did not have time to do its job. It had barely finished its first task. Um, and had just begun its second task of really investigating and fact-finding about what's happening in New York State. And my general impression is that Andrew Cuomo shut it down because it got too close to those who he has close ties to. But he has never publicly explained it in a way that makes sense to me or explained his relationship to uh, Larry Schwartz meddling with the Moreland commissioners. And that, to me, is a pretty basic violation of public trust because we have a serious problem in New York State. Time for, for one more question. Let me get uh, this woman in the back here. And then, and then I have a mini question for you. That a I mini think, question. I have a mini question at the very end, which I will, I will take the prerogative to ask, unless, unless this woman asks it. So we'll see. <laughs> um, hi. hi. Uh, OK. My understanding is that the members of the Supreme Court have to not only um, avoid any sort of conflict of interest, but even the appearance of conflict of interest. So basically my comment, it's more of a comment, but is about, about the time of Citizens United, um, Justices Scalia and Thomas went to a huge gala put on by the Koch brothers and it's like, I mean, in addition to what I think is very activist things on, on their part, yeah. um, I mean, that just seems blatantly what you're talking about yeah. in terms of corruption. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, I'm going to answer by reference to Hobbes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so uh, there's different things going on with this Supreme Court, but... Uh, Thomas Hobbes fundamentally just didn't believe there was such a thing as corruption because people were fundamentally egoist. And I actually think part of the Supreme Court has that same view. It's that corruption at some deep level, part of the reason they keep striking down anti-corruption laws is because they actually don't understand what we're talking about when we're talking about corruption. It actually is a deeply incoherent concept. So somebody once wrote about Montesquieu and Hobbes that it wasn't that uh, they disagreed with each other. They just had a totally different view of like what makes a person, like whether it's possible to be public spirited or not. I don't know that that's entirely true, but I, I feel like Scalia deeply misunderstands the corrupting power of gifts. He's shown that over and over and over again, and it's either a kind of naivete or something far worse. But I agree with you. I think it's um, very uh, disappointing. Is it more than disappointing? <laughs> it's wrong. I mean, they shouldn't be doing that. So it's, it's, it's touching that, and I think touching to me and touching to other people in, the, in a place like the Maxwell School, that someone that talks about Aristotle, Montesquieu, Hobbes uh, can get 33% of the vote. So, um, so, 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 so I'll take the prerogative to ask this last mini question, as I said, and it's... Okay. Keep promising. Okay. Okay. Where is he? The second to the last. All right. Okay. I, all right. You have you have the second to the last question. Go ahead, sir. Um, my question is also uh, kind of off of uh, the stuff kind of surrounding the protest, um, but it's more skewed in the parallel between when you're talking earlier about uh, funding, uh, the yeah. ninety-six percent who believe that it should be changed, and the ninety-one percent who believe uh, that it can't be changed. Yeah. Um, so my question is around those in power, the politicians or administrators, uh, in this case, just because I know more about this, uh, although it is a similar structure in some, uh, some ways. Uh, what responsibility do those in power uh, have to listen to uh, the people who are asking? So as a politician, uh, when you hear that 91% of the voters, or at least those uh, who've been polled, who as a, I'm a psychology student, uh, polls have their own problems, but are also a good judge of uh, feeling. Um, what responsibility to those uh, politicians or those in power have 
to watch that and to respond to not just uh, where the money comes from and where mm -hmm. uh, you get your power to make change, but also to those that they're serving in the public. Yeah, I, um, I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll give a shorter <laughs> answer um, if I can. I, I think the responsibility to see and listen is um, as uh, equal to the responsibility to lead. Um, I don't know if any of you saw this, but there was this videotape at the end of the campaign where Andrew Cuomo didn't see me at a Labor Day parade. And, um, yeah. and, um, and I, I think part of the reason it resonated is it's an experience a lot of citizens have. They feel unseen and unheard. And I think the reason they feel unseen and unheard is, is because so many people in power are listening only to a very small subset. Um, so I think it is our job to build structures that will enable that seeing and hearing. Because when you're dealing with a broad community, you, you can't just sort of have everybody have full time. But actually, you have to have a process for seeing and hearing. And right now, with the campaign funding system we have, it leads to it being very hard to actually see and hear other people. Um, so I, I, I just think it's a, it's a basic ethical obligation of leadership. <laughs> Very last question. Will we see you again on the campaign trail? I hope so. Any, <laughs> any, we, we, will, we, will, we, will, we will take that as an early okay. return. <laughs> okay. uh, and again, thanks so much Thank for this. You. It was really interesting. Thank it was really you. Good. Thank you all.